2007 may actually have been the last truly great year for video gaming. Oh, there have been plenty of great games since then, don't get me wrong, but just think of all the amazing, legendary, wonderful games that debuted in that one year. Portal, Team Fortress 2, Mass Effect, Halo 3, Bioshock, Metroid Prime 3, Persona 3, Super Mario Galaxy, Assassin's Creed, Gears of War, Lost Planet, and dozens more. And then there was Crackdown. No one cared about Crackdown before it launched. A janky looking action game with a weird and kind of ugly art style it seemed like your typical clumsy attempt to launch a new idea on a next gen console without the creative or technical chops to back it up. It was going to be the next Zone of the Enders, a game that people only bought because of the bonus that came with it. In this case, a beta code for Halo 3. But a funny thing happened. People decided to kill time with the game on the disc while they were waiting for the Halo beta to launch. And they discovered that Crackdown was basically wonderful. I suppose we should have seen it coming. After all, the developer behind Crackdown, Real Time Worlds, was headed up by the guy who invented Grand Theft Auto, David Jones. Right about the time that Jones left Rockstar North, GTA started to take itself much more seriously. The manic whimsy of the early games vanished beneath an onslaught of gangster movie pastiche and not actually very clever satire of American culture. But Crackdown, that was old school GTA on steroids. No, really, steroids. Players took control of a faceless, nameless urban super commando who started off far more powerful than mere mortals who occupied his world and quickly grew in power and skill as he gained combat experience. Everything about Crackdown felt like the good bits of GTA cranked up to 11. The faceless player character, the agent, who worked for the agency, was GTA's nameless thug writ larger than life. The agent was literally not a character. He was a mass-produced and completely expendable soldier in the war on crime, an infinitely renewable resource. When an agent dies in Crackdown, players don't respond so much as take control of an identical clone replacement. So grim. Crackdown satirized the militarization of the American police force in much the same way that GTA attempted to satirize Hollywood's glorification of criminal life. It's kind of like the anti-battlefield hardline, come to think of it. The open world of Pacific City felt like the open world of GTA games, but it was truly limitless and unbounded. Nothing was blocked off when you first started the game. You could go anywhere. Players had a simple task, take down three criminal gangs. And how they went about that was left entirely to their discretion. Each gang had a boss, and each boss had lieutenants. You could head straight for the gang boss's headquarters the moment you began the game, but chances were pretty good that you would die horribly before you even reached the boss's chamber. No, it was much better to go after the sub-bosses first, since each of them fed into their overlord's strength. Take out a specific lieutenant, and the boss might have fewer soldiers, or equip them with weaker firearms, or give them less body armor. It was really up to you to determine the order in which you dismantled each army. Then again, you didn't even really have to pay attention to the story if you didn't want. While Crackdown didn't offer much in the way of side missions, it kind of didn't matter. Getting about Pacific City was so fun in and of itself, thanks to your superhuman abilities, that the entire game world became a raucous playground. Interestingly, Crackdown debuted a few months before Assassin's Creed, which also incorporated open world transversal and parkour into its mechanics as well. But Crackdowns, I think, were much more satisfying. They required more effort, but the stunning verticality of Pacific City made for some truly fascinating and unique play scenarios. And for jerks like me who loved playing Sniper, the interactive skyscrapers made for some spectacular perches. Not to mention how satisfying it was just to level up your jump mechanics and reach new heights that previously had been just out of reach. The real secret of Crackdown's success, however, came from its online cooperative play. The most popular trend of E3 2014 was still in its infancy back seven years ago, and Crackdown helped forge the way. You could team up with a friend to take down the bad guys, although generally I spend most of my co-op time goofing around, doing dumb stuff like abusing the scenery in the shipping docks or trying to toss cars while my friends were standing on top of them. And while Crackdown's co-op was pretty primitive and limited compared to current takes on the concept, it was insanely addictive at the time. And really, Crackdown was a game far ahead of its time. All the things that made it unique, open world, cooperative play, freeform mission structure, quirky art style, these are things that the industry at large has only begun to adopt en masse over the past couple of years. I'll admit, Crackdown feels a little creaky today. Its world is a bit sparse, its mission structure overly simplistic, its controls unfashionable. But you know, it's okay. Microsoft is bringing back the series for Xbox One. It'll be interesting to see how the game that helped set the tone for the current generation will stack up amidst dozens of others of games that do many of the things that Real Time Worlds attempted seven years ago. In any case, the time is right for a Crackdown revival, so keep your eyes glued to usgamer.net for more gushing about Crackdown. And remember, there was never a Crackdown 2.